Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are looking at Rhaenyra. As this is uh, obviously one of the central characters in House of the Dragon, I thought it's probably just worth right at the front of this video just saying what the spoiler policy is for this channel. And it's quite simple. Show spoilers are not okay. Book spoilers are okay. The book has been out for a while, Fire and Blood, and they are at the moment following quite closely to the book that they haven't copied everything exactly some things in the book are quite up in the air maybe this happened maybe that happened and they've made a choice on the tv show but obviously some of the things we're going to be talking about are in the future for Rhaenyra in terms of the book and will probably happen roughly along those lines on the show so that's where we're at. Um, as long as everyone's on board, then we will get into this. Um, I'm not going to do, I normally, <coughs> pardon me, I normally try and do a, a sort of an overview of a, a Targaryen's life. We're going through a long series of looking at the different kings and queens and could have been kings and could have been queens of Westeros. Uh, normally I try and do a little bit of a, an overview of the character history. I thought for this, it's, uh, as everybody's, I assume seen House of the Dragon, we know a lot of this background, so I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail. But I will just pick out a couple of things that I think it's worth emphasising from the book perspective that make it slightly different to what the dynamic is on the show. And the main one is that um, Rhaenyra, as we know, she is the only surviving child, oldest daughter, only surviving child of Viserys and Queen Emma. Emma died in the book when Rhaenyra was eight and Viserys remarried when she was nine. And Alicent at that point was 18. So the dynamic that we have on the TV show, <coughs> pardon me, sorry, I got a bit of a cough today. The dynamic we have on the TV show is, is a very strong one between Alicent and Rhaenyra. And we're almost being invited to see season one of the show as being very much the breakdown of that strong, close bond between the two of them. And can they, right at the very end, it was a question of, can the two of them find a way to not go to war with their great childhood friend? Now, that's not the case in the book. That's simply not how this, uh, George Martin has set this up. Um, to start with, they got on like a stepmother and a stepdaughter. Rhaenyra was nine. Alicent was 18. Rhaenyra at the time was the realm's delight. Everyone loved her. She was precocious. She was bright. She was beautiful. She was everywhere. It's very rare to find Viserys without Rhaenyra close by. And everybody loved her. And that dynamic was played into by Alicent until... She and her new uh, heirs that she was producing, or potential heirs that she was producing, started to be a threat. And it was as Rhaenyra grew up, she saw more of this threat. And as more people started to come around to the idea that maybe Aegon should be the uh, main heir of, or the heir to Viserys, that's when this started to break down. So it's not a matter of there being a great friendship uh, that, uh, that broke down over a, a long period of time. Um, it's a matter of uh, th the dynamic between the two of them shifted as uh, they both grew up and as the situation changed. So that's that's the first thing I would pro probably wish to, and um, is, is pretty well reflected, I think, in the show, but I think it's probably also worth pointing out, is that Rhaenyra, by the time of the outbreak of the war, Rhaenyra is still relatively young. Yes, she's had, by that point, she's had five children, two marriages, but... She's still only 32, something along those lines. So this is not a matter of her suddenly being ancient. Um, she is uh, somebody who has settled down by this point and seems to have been a very different 
mind situation to where Alison is. So those are the two big things I would probably just sort of draw your attention to in terms of sort of the difference between uh, the the show uh, Rhaenyra and the book Rhaenyra. But let's get into a couple of things just in the chat. First of all, Ryan Larkin, thank you very much for the super sticker. I appreciate that. Um, Mike Schwartz saying, love you, dude. I love you back. Saying, what do you think was Rhaenyra's greatest mistake during the dance? Um, oh, well, that's an interesting question. I, I think... I, I th Fundamentally, the, the, the issue came when they took King's Landing. We will get on to this. They, they, uh, the first phase of the war was basically building up to a huge strategic error from Team Green when they, uh, basically the army and their um, main dragon left uh, Vagar and Christian Cole's army left King's Landing, leaving it wide open in Suits Rain era. Great. The, from that moment though, it started going downhill. What was her mistake? Well, I guess you could argue that it was just um, not believing, we've, we've got questions on this, but not believing the fact that the, the strength of the ruler is only ever given to them by the people. This is something that comes up a couple of times in the show. Uh, I will mention this a bit later, but I think that is probably... Uh, the biggest problem. And then she loses faith in the people who were on her side. She turns against people who may not be her biggest fans, but they are her allies. She turns against Corlys Velaryon. She turns about against the Dragon Seeds. She basically turns against Daemon. When she starts turning against people on her own side, that I think made defeat pretty inevitable. Um, but let's go to um, uh, a question uh, from, because uh, I saw a few people in the chat talking about this just before we went on air, um, from George R. R. Tolkien saying, Salutations, Robert. I wanted to ask you about the recent news about them shortening season two of House of the Dragon to eight episodes instead of the traditional ten. Do you think they're going to shorten the story more uh, to the point where we're link, uh, where we'll only get three seasons of the show instead of the projected four seasons. I know George R. R. Martin has said he thinks the show should be four seasons. Do you think we will be denied special moments in the story? Okay, so um, yeah, this this news story came out just in the last couple of days, and it's been confirmed season two is going to have eight episodes, not ten. Season one had 10 episodes, and this was sort of released uh, the, the way they kind of feed this story to sort of uh, friendly websites, journalists, people like that. And they sort of gave it out at the same time that they were sort of dangling the, the carrot that, oh, but they are already looking at renewing for season three. They knew people would be a bit concerned, but they wanted to say this is not uh, because we're losing faith in this project. Season three is almost certainly going to be happening. So um, what do I think? Well, I, I, I get the concern. I know a lot of people are concerned about this. They're, they're cutting it down. I think that the people have still got a little bit of a memory at the back of their head. The later seasons of Game of Thrones, they cut the story down hugely. Um, that did not work well. I think a lot of people are still concerned about that. I, at the moment, I am still in the camp that this House of the Dragon is in good hands. Ryan Condal has shown that he cares about the source material. George R. R. Martin is involved in a way he was not involved in the second half of Game of Thrones, the TV show. So at the moment, they still have my faith, they still have my trust, um, and so I'm, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. And in the vein of that, the, what I would say is what matters, there are two things that matter more to me than the number of episodes in a season. Uh, the first is the length of the episode. House of the Dragon season one, the episode lengths were pretty impressive, actually. They averaged over an hour each. If you compare that back to Game of Thrones, then those episodes averaged... Now, 50 minutes or so, about 10 minutes less. So 
what we've got going on with uh, if we have an eight episode season, which keeps up the hour plus length, that's actually in terms of screen time, probably roughly the same as having a 10 episode season of something like Game of Thrones. So I'm not too bothered about the screen time if they're going to keep up the episode lengths. If the episodes are going to come down to half an hour, that might be a concern. But if the episodes are staying long, less of concern. The second thing is I'm I'm a big fan of allowing of of making sure that the um each episode and each season follows the right arc. And you're not chopping things to reach some kind of predetermined number. What I mean by that is back in you know 10 years or so, when we had just network TV stations, not so much streaming, you would find particularly comedy shows where you have this certain number of minutes, you have a certain number of shows you have to do uh, each season. You have to make sure that the plot for something fits into those parameters. Uh, this fed over into drama series as well, and that it was very clear. You have this number of episodes per season. Each episode is this number of uh, minutes. That actually is the enemy of good art, in my view, because you should allow the story to go the length that it needs to be. If you look at A Song of Ice and Fire, the way that George R. R. Martin writes, he doesn't write each chapter of a set number of words. Some of them, like two, sometimes even three times the length of others, because he needs in a particular chapter to get a certain arc done. Similarly, within books, the books vary in size because he needs to get a particular arc done for a particular book. That, I think, should be the same for TV shows. As far as I'm concerned, if they've sat down, and this is what they're telling us, and I'm going to believe them for the time being, but this is what they're telling us, is they sat down and worked out and said, you know what? The story we're trying to tell in season two is eight episodes long. If that's the case, then it should be eight episodes long. I do not wish them to pad it out to ten episodes. The concern is if... Uh, they are then saying, OK, well, we're trying to squish down. The story should have four seasons of 10 episodes and we're going to squish it down. Um, I've not got a hint of that yet. Um, I don't think, yes, there are lots of cuts going on across streaming services all over the place. I don't think that House of the Dragon is what's going to get squeezed. I, th I think that this is one of the, the, the temple... Um, uh, products that HBO have. This is the thing that they want to get right. They're going to give the maximum amount of freedom to Ryan Condal and George R. R. Martin, who's heavily involved in this, to get this right. My understanding is that we're still looking at four seasons. They have discussed three, doing it in three seasons. It depends. For me, it depends on what story you're trying to tell. If you wish to end it at the end of The Dance of the Dragons, uh, you could cut that off when, I don't know, when Ray Rhaenyra, hashtag spoilers, when Rhaenyra gets killed, you could end it there. You could probably squeeze that into three seasons if you wanted to. If you want to tell the whole story to where I would like them to take it up to, which is the moment at which Craig and Stark turns turns around and heads back up north. We know uh, Aegon II is dead, Aegon III is going to be crowned. If you take it up that far, I think that's a four-season show. And I think that there's a very clear... I thought about this far more than any sane person should do. I think there's a very clear breakdown. Season one, as we've had, is the build-up. Season two takes us all up to the fall of uh, King's Landing. Season three takes us to the second fall of King's Landing. Season four takes us through to the end. So that, for me, is how this works as a structure maybe they've got other ideas but um in terms of the the main concern here is the announcement that there's going to be eight episodes rather than 10 a good or bad thing i think the answer is let's wait and see <laughs> if it's for artistic dramatic reasons because they have eight episodes worth of story arcs that they wish to be sharing with us um within the wider arc of of a season great if it's because they're trying to squash it, maybe not so good. Um, let's just have a quick flick through the uh, 
chat to see if anyone had any other thoughts there. Um, uh, Kobaso, or Kobasos82 saying, usually HBO cuts episodes per season, but ends up spending immense time on making it super quality per episode, so I wouldn't worry. Um, uh, Greet Weirwood saying British seasons were shorter. Yeah, in terms of TV shows, they often would uh, have been in the past. Um, if you go to, I mean, actually, if you think of like something like Forty Towers, for for those who are fans of classic British comedy, that only did two seasons of six episodes each. The the original British Office, similarly, two seasons of six episodes each with a Christmas special. Um, that they, they did not. The, the British standard has never been for like um, 10, 20 episodes per season. Um, Joseph Newhouse saying, hi, Robert. Thanks for the inspiration. Thank you very much. Uh, Dirty Sheepdog saying, I'm not worried about the eight episode season. Just hope that it doesn't lead to shorter seasons in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the question is whether this is setting a precedent. I don't um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not, I've not really seen it. Um, uh, flick through. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, uh, Matthew just saying what? Only eight episodes? Why? Yeah, we were just talking about that. Okay, let's go to a question from Martin S. Saying, "Good evening, Robert. Uh, maybe you've talked about this at some point, but is the relationship be between Rhaenyra and Damon in the novel the same as the show, or have they changed that?" Um. <sighs> I mean, these kinds of things are always quite hard because the book is not written as a novel. It's not written even with one clear timeline going through. It's written as a history book, an in-world history book, where the maester who's writing it sort of says, well, one source says this happened, another source says that happened, a third idea was this, um, I'll allow you, the reader, to decide. That happens a lot in Fire and Blood, um, which means that Actually, part of the dynamic of reading that book is you are deciding for yourself. You're trying to read between the lines to understand what's happening and to decide for yourself what these different characters are like. We do not get POV chapters like we have in A Song of Ice and Fire or, or Duncan Egg. We don't have that kind of thing here. So in terms of the relationship between uh, Damon and Rhaenyra, a lot of the same things happened uh, in the book as on the show, although in the book we're left to decide um, whether that was exactly what happened or whether something slightly different happened. It's probably worth saying that the bigger change is not actually um, to Rhaenyra. The bigger change is to the character of Daemon. They have shifted the character of Daemon Targaryen, um, in my view, quite significantly. Not in a bad way. I think Matt Smith's done a fantastic job. I think he's a great character on the show, but he feels quite different. Because, and they were quite open about this, because they, they said early on, they sat down and worked out what is driving Daemon Targaryen. What is it that's his main driving force? And they decided that it's actually his love for his family is a bigger driving force than his desire for power. That's not quite how I saw it in the book. His character is a lot more, is a lot darker, I think, in the book um, and feels a lot more dangerous. And almost every, at almost every turn, he seems to be trying to grab power for himself. That definitely isn't what's happening on the show yes he does seem to to want power but you can see his Achilles heel Viserys and Rhaenyra all the way through season one you can that that is the key driving point for Damon and that fundamentally therefore shifts our understanding of that dynamic that relationship between the two of them on the show uh, or in the book you look at it and think almost as if he is using her. He is using her as a way to get to power. There might well be a, a strong relationship between the two of them, but clearly this seems to be an element of it. On the show, 
there there seems to have been that bond, that uh, uh, kinship between the two of them, and he is vulnerable. He is vulnerable when she is, is concerned. If she gets angry with him, you think that that would hurt him hugely, which is something to keep an eye on for later on in the season. Um, season three, probably. Um, but Viserys was a vulnerable point for him, and Rhaenyra is a vulnerable point for him. That's not something we ever really picked up on in the books. Um, let's go to a question from Travis, saying, what can you tell me about the relationship between Rhaenyra and Alicent in the book, particularly pre-dance? Are those differences going to have implications for the coming seasons? Well, um, yes, I already talked about the big difference. The, the, the big difference between it was that the there was an age gap to start with, so they were not besties. They were never besties in the book, which meant that the two of them could be um, uh, more at odds. Although it's fair to say that um, Alison's role is is beefed up, is in the show. It is her as a leader of the decision on what to be doing to send them to war. That's a show thing. In the book, the the decision the green council took a while and it seems to have been very much led by otto Kristen cole seems to have been very important alicent is also there but there's none of this vying for control of aegon and then which approach should we take should we go for otto's approach of just all out war straight away um or should we go for alicent's approach of should we try and negotiate first that's not in the book at all so that has already shifted how that how the the war is playing out because we've got Alicent who is she at the moment she appears as if she doesn't really want the war if she could get away without having war she would get away without having a war Otto Kristen Cole seem to be quite happy with the idea of going straight to war regardless how will this shift play out into later seasons well, I think what we're going to see is a big battle, particularly I think in season two, a big internal battle in Team Green about who is in control. Um, and we've got Otto, we've got Alicent, we've got Kristen Cole, um, we've got uh, Aegon himself and Aemund, who all will have slightly different motivations going into this. And they all will have, um, they will be, will be vying for control. We saw some of that in the book, but I think they will play this up a huge amount more. And I think that Alicent is going to be the big loser in this. So when we do get a final ish confrontation between Alicent and Rhaenyra, it's not going to be as on, on the show, it's going to be a lot more um, layered than it was in the book. Um, Kaziglu Bay saying, based on the show character, who wins in a fight, Rhaenyra or Alicent? Um, well, uh, Rhaenyra's got a dragon, so I think I will uh, I will go with that. Um, Carl Karsnark saying, uh, Alicent and Rhaenyra being the same age also makes the story generational. Old guard like uh, Viserys, who still have a wee bit of connection to the old country versus new entirely Westerosi families and politics. Yeah, so they um, uh, they played up, and I think I think this was, this was good. They played up on the show the difference between the more Targaryen-y Team Black. Um, we have. Uh, particularly Damon being established, set up as very much this voice of what it's like to be Valyrian. He speaks Valyrian a lot. He sings to to, to Vermithor the dragon. He brings gifts of Valyrian steel. He's he's the person who's there representing old Valyria. Alicent is now representing the faith of the Seven, effectively the the Westerosi gods um, with her 
seven pointed star um necklace which she yeah she, she's got there and although yes she's quite happy for her children to be uh, riding dragons because that brings power that's not this this isn't a valyrian thing um mara lee thank you very much uh, very generous thank you mara saying just a show of love support and appreciation for the fabulous content stories and much on the three channels you are the best hugs to dan you're a handsome dog well thank you very much yes three channels now in case you have missed it um i have got my second channel which i've had for a while the well-told tale which is me reading audiobooks if you like the sound of that, go and check out uh, The Well-Told Tale. But I am launching, I'm still sort of soft launching it, um, uh, IDG Live. There's a link down in the description. There'll be a link at the end of the video as well. Um, IDG Live, which is where all my live content will be going. As of May, these live streams will be moving over to that channel. Um, easy to find, do not worry. We'll be doing exactly the same thing over there, plus short form content, interviews with people, that kind of stuff. So that's going to have a slightly different feel over on that new channel. Um, if you want to go over there and subscribe, I'm already starting to put new um, uh, new bits of content on there, as well as uh, these live streams after they have aired. Uh, and Marley, thank you also for the super sticker. Um, Dagon Tranos saying, in Fire and Blood, Rhaenyra is early on very imperious and dark, while show Rhaenyra is chill and her dark side is mostly triggered by traumatic events. I don't get the same vibes. Um, so, I mean, I don't know whether when you're saying Rhaenyra early on very imperious and dark, I, I think I, I got the impression on the show uh, early Rhaenyra was just struggling to find her role. Um, she knew that she'd been made the heir, but then her father has remarried her to her best friend and now has new young children. Where does she fit into all of this? Um, she's got this charismatic, cool uncle who sometimes comes in and shows her uh, the wonders of the world and tells her that she can go and do whatever she wants to, but at the same time, she feels as if she has to stay she's desperately trying to figure out who she is and what she's doing in life. That is my take on the show, the, the early Rhaenyra on the show. In the books, early Rhaenyra starts out as the realm's delight, but then slowly over time starts to grow more suspicious and then disliking and then eventually basically hating uh, Team green so that's my kind of take on both of them they they got the moment sort of right i think that she is taking a darker turn it'll be really interesting to see whether they go with this in season two because she does in in the book it's when aegon is pronounced king um and she loses her child that sends her into this black dark rage um, which is then added to when she loses Lucerus, her son, um, in the uh, the dragon fight that we saw at the Battle of a Shipbreaker Bay, which we saw at the end of the season. In on the show, they yes, she was sad about losing her child, but it really was they waited for the dramatic moment of the. By the way, your son has been killed. That's the moment she turned. But in both, they had this moment. They had this time when she had been. Um, simmering feeling as this resentment towards the other side, but then suddenly she's gone, and that is the that is the moment which we should be looking back on in season two. We should be looking back on and going from then on. She chose a different path, um, like Cersei. She woke up and chose violence. Um. Andrew Kay saying in the text, uh, she was, though she was quick to anger and held on to um, any slight, um, even fed people to her dragon and likely complicit in Lainor's death at this point. House of the Dragon is a more favorable portrayal. Yeah, I, I think most of the characters in House of the Dragon, I think it's fair to say they've softened, given a slightly more favorable um, uh, interpretation of, I, I think there are a couple. Otto and Kristen don't come out very well. Larry Strong doesn't come out very well. But there are Damon, Rhaenyra, 
Alicent, a lot of characters, Viserys, come out a lot. You have a lot more sympathy for them, which I guess works because we don't ever see their POV in the book, whereas on the show we do understand a whole lot more about what drives them. But yes, Rhaenyra definitely is a more a sympathetic character. What will be interesting is over the course of probably the next couple of seasons, she should start doing things which we unambiguously should go, no, that's not a good thing. That's pretty bad. Will she keep our goodwill? Um, will they try to make us uh, sympathise with her still when she goes down that sort of slightly darker path? That will be quite interesting to see. Um Let's go to a question from one of my patrons. Um, Travis, can you walk me through why the Valarions supported Rhaenyra? From what I see, they have been uh, screwed at least four times by Rhaenyra and Daemon. Uh, Rhaenyra's blatant infidelity, Laenor's death, Daemon's death over his lies about Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra and Daemon's marriage to each other so soon after the deaths of both children. It makes even less sense to me when it seems very clear that everyone knows that Lainor's sons weren't his, it can't just be that they technically have the Valarian name, can it? Uh, make it make sense. Um, okay, so this is one of those things where, uh, and, and you said that you've uh, you've watched the show before reading the books. So um, some of these things are more blatant on the show than they are in the book. So, for example. Um, the death of Lenor in the um, in the book, Lenor is killed by his lover, and it's just then left for other people to speculate. Well, why might his lover have killed him? Is it possible that maybe Damon might have paid him to do it? But there's no real hint um, of of. Or there's, there are hints, but there's there's no basis in fact. On the show, it's very clear. Basically, Damon and Rainier are saying, well, we'll take the hit for this. You've been killed. Um, uh, and we'll allow people to think that we did it. So on, in the book, that's not so clear. Um, also, the Damon and Rainier are getting together um, on the show, the way that they filmed it, they got together basically um, after... Damon's wife's funeral um, just there on that day um, and got married. They didn't really give some kind of timestamp on it, but pretty much straight away. Now, that's not exactly what happened in the book. It was six months later. So, uh, yes, still quite fast, but not quite that slapping the face kind of fast. Uh, so a lot of these things, they... Um, in the book, it's not as clear. Um, and so it is, in my view, as, as simple as saying House Valarion supported um, Rhaenyra because that was their team. And they lobbied hard for Rhaenyra to marry Lainor. They knew that Lainor was gay. Um, and I think that they probably figured out, like everyone else, that her children were not Lenor's children. But this brought the Velaryons into the ruling family. So what was the other option? That they support Aegon, and uh, that that's not going to um, bring about um, the Velaryons coming into being part of the ruling family, because we've already had... Aegon has already married his sister, so that is out of the way so they can't even marry into it again no they, they, their fates were tied with uh, uh, Rhaenyra and so they just went with it Martin S saying it seems Westeros is largely inspired by British history particularly the War of the Roses is there some inspiration from other places on earth too well the, yeah there's a lot so Westeros um, uh, the uh, is but there's a lot of British history in Westeros history, um, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of the inspirations we've got here. People in the chat, I'm sure, feel, feel free to drop your favorite bit of inspiration from 
around the world for different things. Um, uh, but geographic-wise, then, yes, broadly, it's uh, it's based on uh, the United Kingdom. Um, the War of the Roses was the inspiration for A Song of Ice and Fire. It doesn't mean it's matching up exactly to it. Um, the anarchy is the bit of British history which is uh, matching up most with the Dance of the Dragons. Uh, so he does take these uh, bits of inspiration from British history, but it's not just British history. There's a um, uh, there's there's a lot of other things which are in there. Um, and Dawn, as a random example, that's not. British in in terms of inspiration um and uh, also you will get for example the iron islands um the 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 raiding and reaving there is a lot more viking feel than british um Terra Incognita saying, I think in the show it was ambiguous enough that it could have been months. Yeah, I, I agree. But the way they cut it, uh, this is talking about the, the marriage between Damon and Rhaenyra. The way they cut it was straight afterwards to make it feel like it was pretty um, pretty immediate. They certainly got together uh, immediately afterwards. Um uh, Chasing Badger saying, oh my gosh, I'm here live for once. Hi there, Chasing Badger, great to see you. Um, uh, let's go to a question from Luna Cascade. Um, Hello, Robert. Thank you for covering Rhaenyra. You're welcome. She is one of the most complex characters in Fire and Blood, House of the Dragon. Can you please speak to the evolution of her character behaviour from spoiled, entitled preteen the kingdom's delight, the realm's delight, to anxious princess, to mature or vengeful, jealous or jealous queen. What is her primary motivation to become queen? So, I mean, I think the primary motivation is that she has been told that it's hers. Um, her father raised her uh, from, pardon me, from the age of eight um, to say, you're going to be my heir. You will take over. He taught her he trained her to be uh, the heir in on the show then he also passed on to her this uh, this great prophecy which has been handed down generation to generation um this was her not just her right but also this was her responsibility he has given her that prophecy, which is basically saying it is now on you to hold together the seven kingdoms or every, yeah, the humanity will die. So on the show, they've even given her a higher um, calling than just, well, I was told this was mine. So um, I, I think, although that's not in the book, I think we can... Um, George R. Martin was aware of this, and I think that he sort of hinted that there is something, if not exactly that, then something very much like that behind the scenes in the book. So there is this kind of feel that she should be queen. Um, but I think it also goes with this kind of, I, you call it entitlement, and I think I would agree, um, is that she was in the right, I think, pretty clearly she had been uh, named the heir but that meant that she felt that she should be queen and so when that was taken away from her this was a sense of indignation this was a sense of um uh, wrongness this was a sense that this is something had been taken from her that never should have been taken from her so Yes, she then started getting angry because then we we probably shouldn't lose sight of the fact that from her perspective, she was wronged again and again and again, right at the beginning of the war before anything else happened. First of all, um, she was wronged by the fact that her throne was taken from her. Then the shock of that led, led her into such a rage she had a miscarriage. Uh, we're not we're not told all of the ins and outs of this, but the implication of the narrative is that this was the cause, the, the miscarriage um, uh, and the loss of a child. And then when she sends out envoys, basically, who were there told specifically not to fight, she loses a son. Um, 
to Amund. She has, before any actual fighting has happened, she feels like she's she's had three things go against her. Huge personal hurts to her. So yes, she does start to get angry at that point. And I think we can understand on a very human level why she gets angry there. She's just lost children. Um, and so she then has to work out who actually is with her. She thinks that the entire realm has already sworn fealty to her, and she now has to go around and find out who actually meant it. Um, in terms of the sort of the um, anxious princess, this is something which they've not really shown us yet on the show. And they only really hint at it, I think, in the book. But this is an extra layer to her character that um, George R. Martin, it's very much a show, not tell kind of thing. He says that oftentimes she would, when she started getting stressed, she would play with the rings on her fingers, um, uh, actually like rubbing the fingers raw by her sort of moving around with the rings on her fingers and that shows that she's holding a huge amount inside particularly in the, the build up to war it, it's almost as if she's holding back who she is and what she's feeling and we see that in this um uh psychologists have got a phrase for it uh something displacement uh behavior is that she's doing she's moving the these uh the rings in a way which is just letting out some of that that feeling uh so that is an anxiety it's also a holding things back and so when she gets to war it almost to me at least anyway it feels as if she can just suddenly let herself go she can be who and do what she always wanted to do and she can just unleash who she is and that brings good things but it also brings some really bad things so um she starts off entitled, then she starts getting anxious uh, about the fact of all of the things, the fear that things might be taken away from her um, and that things are unfair. She was made to marry Lainor. Let's not forget she was made to marry Lainor. She did not want to. She only married him because Viserys, her father, said, I will take you out of the line of succession. You will no longer be my heir if you do not marry this man. Um, so she has had to do things she, she did not wish to do in order to retain that position. And then when she thinks finally her time has come, it is just taken away from her. Um, uh, Uzair Ahmed saying, have you done your research yet with links on Ottoman Sultan Murad IV and Magor Targaryen? Yeah, this is something you asked me a while ago. I did have a quick look. Yeah, he, there definitely are a lot of um, similarities. This is a, a Sultan um, from the Ottoman Empire um, who um, he died very young, but he had a whole host of concubines and none of his sons from those concubines lived uh, or even lived longer than he did so um there is certainly a vibe to magor uh, about him yeah that's a, a good spot um andrew case saying um though text allison was quite ambitious and complicit in her own right but yes uh, heard otto's poison uh, for quite a long time yeah so the um Alison, as a sort of the counterpoint to uh, Rhaenyra, also is somebody who is placed in a situation where she is maybe having to do things that she, I mean, it was very clear on the show, she was doing things that she did not have to or did not want to do, or things were done to her that she did not want to have, have done. Um, Andrew K saying, I personally see a lot of similarities between Rhaenyra and Cersei, especially the perceived slights and resentment of the system and patriarchy. Yes, there's definitely an element there. Um, one thing, I don't think I've got a question on this direct, um, but it's something I've, I've mentioned previously when talking about Rhaenyra. I think one of the things which is going to be a very clear echo from the Dance of the Dragons across to uh, um, A Song of Ice and Fire is what happens when Cersei 
rules effectively. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but the way that A Song of Ice and Fire has been set up is that Cersei is going to do something big and dramatic, which is going to uh, try to take out um, uh, the Faith of the Seven and its power base within uh, King's Landing and also the Tyrells. Now, perhaps she's going to blow up the Great Sept like she did on the show. Uh, perhaps she'll do something slightly different, but it's going to be something like that. But after it, she is going to be effectively ruling. She's already lost um, Kevin Lannister. The very last chapter we have of uh, Song of Ice and so Fire so far is the loss of Kevin Lannister. And... Um, that's an epilogue chapter, and we see get that going through. If you read between the lines, it's a fantastic chapter. Again and again, we see Cersei basically saying what she thinks should happen, and Kevin going, no, that's not a good idea. We're going to do this thing instead. And the things that she wants to do are things like uh, raising taxes. Uh, they're things like... Uh, cutting off a king's landing um they are the kinds of things um and putting people's heads on spikes the kinds of things that Rhaenyra did when she had her six months at the end of that six months Rhaenyra got chased out of king's landing basically by the people and that i think is roughly what's going to be happening with cersei i think that she is going to do what she wants to do and at the end of it the people will turn against her we've already had this again and again in the earlier books of the Song of Ice and Fire, the people of King's Landing getting a bit grumpy. They're having riots. Um, they're they're um, turning on the elites, but no, nothing that has been really affecting the, the people in the Red Keep. I think there will be a time. George R. R. Martin has been setting this up. There's going to be an equivalent of the storming of the uh, the dragon pit, which will lead to her being pushed out. Um, Bowstring saying, greetings, Robert, and fellow uh, in Deep Geek fans. Uh, first time watching and um, just wanted to show some appreciation. Uh, well, welcome. It's great, uh, great to see you. Um, and is there hope for Tales of Planetos and Well Told Tale? Greetings from Sweden. Um, uh, oh, that's a, well, I think this might be a super chat. Uh, thank you so much for that. Oh, that's very kind of you. Um, so on the Well Told Tale, at the moment, I'm, I'm looking to shift this over time. But at the moment, that is just public domain works. Um, in terms of uh, the kind of stories that I, lots of people ask, can I read... Narnia, can I do Lord of the Rings? Can I read A Song of Ice and Fire? Uh, the, the answer to those things, unfortunately, is no, um, because they are not public domain, and uh, that would cost a stupid amount of money um, uh, in order to get the rights to be able to do that. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, one thing I can offer people is George R. R. Martin has done a few pre-release chapters from The Winds of Winter. He's made them publicly available. Um, and these are not these are not final drafts. So um, although we can be reasonably certain that they're roughly what's going to be there, he has said that he has rewritten at least one of them. But he has done some pre-release chapters from the Winds of Winter that if you go to my Patreon, you should be able to find them. They, I, I recorded them a long time ago. I think there's something like eight or nine different chapters. But if you're interested in that, uh, do go and uh, want to hear me narrating them, then they are down on my Patreon page. Um, let's go to a question from Creative Branches saying, well, hello there. Hello there. Um, Aemond explicitly losing control of his dragon rather than simply going after Jace over Storm's End Sea may come, pardon me, may come to light later in the show. Do you think this truth will be hidden from the public? Do you think Rhaenyra will find out that this was an accident? And how might that influence her actions going forward? Okay, so um, in the book, there's no hint of this. The the idea that Aemon lost control of Vega and that's what, um, that's what happened. In the book, it's very clear that Aemond went 
after uh, Luke and basically Vagor was just too big a dragon for Arax and he killed him. End of story. That's it. Eamond comes back, tells everyone this is what happened, and the story moves on. But the fact is there's only one person on the show, as well as in the book, who could actually report on what happened, and that is Eamon. So if the wider world gets to know that uh, Eamon lost control of his dragon, it would have to be because Eamon says, I lost control of my dragon. Um, or perhaps they see him lose control of his dragon another time and go, huh, maybe he lost control of his dragon that earlier time. But he will, but generally he will have to be the person who says it at this point. And I can't see that happening because the way that the character of Eamon has been set up on the show does seem to suggest that he will re return back and be like, yep, I killed him. And then everybody's going to get a bit angry. But is he going to admit, is he going to stand there in front of everyone else and say, you'll never guess what happened, but I can't control this dragon. Um, <laughs> so uh, having made such a big thing of the fact that he has claimed this dragon, Vagar being the, the biggest, most impressive, oldest, most vicious dragon in all of Westeros, um, is he really, is, is his ego going to allow him to turn around and say, actually, I can't control this dragon. I can't see that. So uh, no, I don't think we're going to, that information is going to come out to the light. If Rhaenyra does hear a hint of that, would she even believe it? Would it matter? By the point that she does learn about this, there is going to be so many more um, deaths and so much more destruction that actually that one thing is not going to make a huge amount of difference. So I think the answer is no. I don't think this is going, this would come out. And if it does come out, I don't think it's going to make much difference. Um, Ranabir Mitra saying, salutations, Robert. Um, in those few months in charge, what can we say was Rhaenyra's tax policy? Can it tr be can it be truly comparable to Magor's tax policy? Well, um, we have a very clear um, description of Rhaenyra's tax policy. The it's not 100% clear the extent to which this was her or the extent to which this was her master of queen, Lord Keltigar, um, who was behind it. She must have at least said, OK, yeah, go do it. Um, but in terms of the tax policy, it's very clear this was a tax policy that affected everyone. There was the normal things that they taxed a little bit more on everything, but then... Um, the, there was a, a tax on uh, per room of your house. There was a tax of entering the city. There was a tax on um, uh, drinking ale. There was a tax on basically absolutely everything you can think of there was a tax on. This was in stark contrast, or George R. R. Martin places it in stark contrast to the description we have of Jaehaerys' tax policy, where he very clearly went for a more progressive tax policy in which this is Rego Graz, his uh, master of coin, in which he was, he taxed luxuries. He taxed the things that only the richest could afford. So they couldn't really say, oh, well, that's not really very fair because it's like they don't have to buy themselves all these silks and, and gems and things like that. Nobody's making them do it. But if they want them, then they have to pay the tax. Rhaenyra's was a regressive tax policy that everyone had to pay. Um, and it didn't matter whether you had money or didn't have money, you pay, you had to pay tax. So that's the difference. We don't get so much about what Magor's tax policy was. Um, but the feeling was that this combined with her regularly executing people and putting their heads up on spikes outside the Red Keep made... Um, uh, made them think that she was cruel. She just did not care. She hated the small folk. She didn't care what was going on with them. She hated anyone who opposed her. She would um, uh, put their heads up. And, and Yes, you could execute someone, but putting somebody's head up for everyone else to see is, that's the next level up. Um, so they might may or may not know what goes on inside the Red Keep, but what they can see is there are lots of executions and everybody 
is having to pay taxes, even those who can't afford it. So that's why they started calling her Magor with teats, uh, which I think, uh, Mara Lee, actually was a question that you uh, you had why they called her that. So that's uh, that's why that was. Um, it was basically just saying we don't we think this person's cruel. <laughs> um, Andrew Kay is saying Amond will surely lean into killing Luke on House of the Dragon in a big way. The die is cast, so he might as well embrace it. Um, uh, yep, I think I would agree with that. Um, let's go to a question from... Oh, well, actually, Lucian in the chat is just saying, I do miss the slightly crueler de depictions of Alicent and Rhaenyra in Fire and Blood. While they are more complex and relatable than the show, I do like the occasional character that is just unapologetically dark. Yeah, I mean, they've got they've got some characters like that. Uh, Larry Strong is unapologetically dark. Um, but, yeah, it's fair to say they've they've smoothed out some of the harder edges on some of the characters. Um, Alison saying, hi, Robert, hi there, saying, what do you think made Rhaenyra's reign a failure in so short a time? The greens and the blacks looked evenly matched at first, but Rhaenyra did not last long on the throne. So there, there's a lot in this. They were evenly matched to start with, but this was more... Um, more a short-term thing. I the, the more I look at the start of the Dance of the Dragons, the more I just think if Rhaenyra had they, they would, this would never happen. But if Rhaenyra had just hung around for five years and waited, they'd have won. Because they the the big problem in terms of dragons, which fundamentally is what this boils down to, was the fact that um Vagar was there who was uh, on team green um and also sunfire but once sunfire was out of the picture then really this is just one big dragon and who have team black got up against that they had lots of dragons and they had lots of dragon riders in comparison the problem was that they were young and inexperienced and a lot of the dragons were quite small if they just waited for five years they would have had lots of medium-sized dragons and you could between them they could easily have taken out Vagar. so that's the uh, sort of meta narrative that i always have going on in my head about this if i knew there was a little bit of patience then they would have probably easily won but in terms of what made her reign not work this boils down to money i think as much as anything else it's um the the situation when Team Black took over, was that this was a city that they had been blockading, an economic blockade for the previous six months or so. It's already starting to struggle. Food can't get in. Um, people are starting to starve. Um, and they came in and the, the Greens had very sensibly, they'd split up the treasury. They decided, OK, well, there's lots of cash here. A quarter of it we'll put in the Iron Bank of Bravos. A quarter of it we'll uh, take over to Old Town. A quarter of it we'll put in Castley Rock. We'll leave one quarter here. That's for the war fund. And they'd spent up almost all of that last quarter that was left in King's Landing. So when Rhaenyra arrives, she's left with a, a city which is already on its knees because she has put it on its knees by doing this naval blockade um, and she's got no money to spend. And she suddenly, she wants, she sees there are enemies around. She needs to be raising an army of her own. Um, how does she do that? She needs money. And that's when the problems start to um, uh, sort of snowball. So it's the situation she finds herself in. And this is a, an issue that we have... Um, not just throughout uh, sort of the world of ice and fire, but also in in the real world, is that every leader, what they can do is dependent on the situation they have before them. I mean, feel free to insert examples from your own countries and your own world uh, worlds and understandings, but 
if somebody comes into a situation where they have no money and uh, they have no room for maneuver, then they probably can achieve a whole lot less than somebody who comes in right in the middle of an economic boom. So that's the biggest problem. Um, the other thing which I sort of hinted at earlier in the stream, but the show have mentioned twice, so I think they're going to emphasize this in the show, is not caring about the small folk. We've already had once, we had um, Miseria, who basically threatened the hand of the king, Otter Hightower, and said, you, you know that you only rule by the will of the people. Um, and secondly, we had Rhaenyra and Daemon going down into um, uh, King's Landing when they were in sort of disguise, um, going down there and he's giving her this pep talk about you can you're a targaryen you can do whatever sh you want and she sort of takes it to the next step well you know i don't really care then what all of these people here think and he sort of says no you have to care about what these people think because these are the people who um you're ruling and the they control your fate and she's like yeah whatever so um twice they've now flagged that up and i think that is going to be something which will come back it will come back when she is ruling King's Landing and uh, she will be there not caring about the people. So I think that is going to be where the show is going to take it, that she does not pay enough attention to uh, the people. And her, the in interesting thing is that her spymaster at the time will be Masseria, who clearly cares about the people of King's Landing. So there will be a tension there straight away between her and Masseria if she does not care about the people of King's Landing. Um, Martin S. saying, how would you rate Rhaenyra on a good versus evil scale? Think 100 as pure good, minus 100 as pure evil, and naught as pure neutral. Uh, you can differentiate between book and show Rhaenyra if you feel it is appropriate. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of going to sidestep this one because I don't think George R. R. Martin writes characters on that kind of sliding scale. I don't think that's the way he wants us to see characters um i don't think that's the way he particularly wants us to understand morality as being between good and evil um so I, in in terms of the characters though um let's see how i can sort of answer this in a slightly different way i, I would say both book and show rainera um clearly do love their families they clearly um, have some sort of a sense of right and wrong, um, uh, but they both certainly book Rhaenyra and presumably show Rhaenyra do go down quite a dark path. So um, it's not at, it's more about the actions and where they are at different points in their story. I think younger Rhaenyra may well have been quite entitled and petulant and stubborn, um, but later on she had a position of power and did she do good things with it i think it's quite hard to argue that she did um let's go to a question from uh, Mara Lee uh, saying Rhaenyra eventually took the capital and reigned for half a year. The maesters noted that she would often get cuts when sitting on the Iron Throne and stated this was the Iron Throne rejecting her and that her time on the throne would be limited. He also asked about uh, whether the Iron Throne was judging Viserys. So yet yeah, the, the, the maesters don't... Um, they don't come to that conclusion. They say that other people did. They say that the pe some people saw this, and this is some, what has apparently happened with Rhaenyra. People saw this, the cuts, and saw her bleeding, and decided that this was the Iron Throne who was um, judging her. Now, I did do a video a long time ago, if you want my full thoughts on the Iron Throne judging people. Um, the, the basic point, though, is that most of this does seem to be an easy way for people to um, back up what they want if they don't want Rhaenyra to be 
the only way of doing that is by pointing out, oh, look, the Iron Throne is judging her. They don't like a king. The Iron Throne is judging him. That seems to be a, a sort of a standard thing that you can say in Westeros. Now, what matters more always in George R. Martin's world is how people react to this rather than the truth or not of a situation. Um, personally, do I think the Iron Throne is judging? No, I don't think it is. Um, if it is, then I think that the likelihood is that it is judging not by whether somebody is a good person in our standards, uh, but by whether or not they are doing what a Targaryen ruler should be doing, according to Aegon's prophecy, A Song of Ice and Fire, because this was a magically created throne. It was created by Dragonfire, and it is in... And, Aegon clearly put thought into this, and he clearly decided, this is Aegon the Conqueror, and he clearly decided that he wanted a throne that you should not sit easily on, so he thought about what the purpose of a throne was, not just for the people who see it, which is the thing we often talk about with the Iron Throne, about how imposing it is and what message it sends to everyone, but Aegon seems to be caring more about the what impact that that has on the ruler so um it's probably not a magical thing but if it is then it will be something that Aegon himself put in there and that will be more about whether somebody is doing what they ought to be doing to keep and honor that um prophecy um let's go to a question from Kristen H saying, hello, Robert. Thank you for all the great content. You're welcome. Uh, I'm excited to hear you discuss Rhaenyra. What is your opinion on the likelihood of the brothel queen story put forward by Mushroom? Do you believe Rhaenyra would allow such a thing to be done specifically to Helena? She always seemed to have some affection for Helena. Okay, so the brothel queen's um, story. This is when Rhaenyra takes... Um, King's Landing, then most people have gone by this point. The uh, the uh, the army has gone out. Christian Cole has gone out. Amund has left um, on Vagar, and uh, Laris smuggles out uh, a lot of the family, um, Aegon specifically. And who's left is Alicent, who has this conversation with uh, Rhaenyra and she basically says uh, okay yeah you've just you've won this bit here but we should have peace if, if you sue for peace right now with with Aegon then I think we might be able to do this um, and then Rhaenyra basically says no and Alicent then probably um, unwisely throws the strong boys slur back out there the yeah, but your children they're not even um uh, true born children these are bastard children then we get one of these moments when uh, uh the the maester of the writer says and mushroom says what happens next is um that uh, alicent and um Helena then got sent to a brothel so that they could um, have illegitimate children themselves so that they should know what it is like if they wish to be talking about illegitimate children all the time. Um, and then the, the, the commentary in the book is basically, we, we shouldn't really believe this. Probably, probably this is just mushroom making stuff up, which mushroom does undoubtedly sometimes mushroom gets it right but sometimes mushroom also creates uh, an interesting salacious story so i think probably no um maybe they will on the show they will uh, I, th I think they wouldn't want to ignore this any in any event but i think perhaps they will have something like a threatening to send her there. I don't think she would send Helena. I don't think she's got anything specific against Helena. Um, but Alicent, if the relationship between the two of them has broken down so far by that point um, that 
um, uh, they're hurling abuse at each other, and uh, Alison's basically going to be locked up. If Rhaenyra is there saying, basically, you killed my son, then yes, she might threaten that. I don't think that they would actually go through with that on the show, but because they've, um, uh, as we've said, they've softened these characters a little bit. Um, happy name day, uh, Lindsay Drohan. Um, and Diego Godoy saying, hola, Robert, hola. My question is a hypothetical one. As far as uh, Rhaenyra knew, her second born with Daemon, Viserys, was lost and presumed dead when his ship was intercepted in the Narrow Sea. Would any of her strategies that followed that event have changed had she known that Viserys was actually alive and well in Essos? Um, interesting question. So, <coughs> I think, I think no is the short answer. So, what happens? is we get um after she loses after Rhaenyra loses um one of her sons uh, she not just her Damon decides that um Damon and Rhaenyra's two young children should be sent off to Essos for safekeeping they hire some ships they send them over but they get caught up in uh, a sea battle and whereas uh, Aegon uh, manages to fly back on his dragon, Viserys doesn't have a dragon at this point. Um, he's just got a dragon egg and he gets captured and presumed killed. Now, what would Rhaenyra, knowing that Viserys is alive, have made any difference to what she does? If anything, this would have distracted her attention because she would have cared so much about her, the safe being, the, the, the well-being and safety of her son, that she might have started being paying attention more to what's going on in Essos than what's going on in Westeros. So that might have distracted her. In terms of strategy, that then no, I think Rhaenyra was not really thinking strategically for the second half of this war. She just was reacting. She just was trying to get um, what she wanted. So I don't think this would have changed anything fundamentally. If she she thought she'd lost her first son, she if she then thought that she lost another son, she then lost a third son in her mind, um, Joffrey, um, and uh, obviously... Jace um, also dies, um, then no, I don't think this would, she would have hugged her children closer, but not in, not in a more strategic sense would this have changed what was going on in the war, in my view. Reflective rambling, uh, oh, happy name day, Lindsay Drohan, you get two happy birthdays. Um, uh, let's go to a question from 444, saying, Hi, Robert. Do you think that in other circumstances, Rhaenyra could have been a good ruler, or was the issue a lack of good ruler necessary attributes? Um, could she have made better decisions if she hadn't experienced the death of almost all of her children? Well, I think, undeniably, not only was, as I said, not only was she presented with a a very hard situation of no money, starving people, um, and a desperate need to raise some cash. Um, that was a hard situation for anyone to come in, but she'd come in at a time when she'd been experiencing loss and death. Um, and she will not, with the best will in the world, none of us would have been in a, in a good headspace. Let's put it that way. Um, so, uh, we cannot, I think, judge her unfairly uh, or judge her accurately based on that six months of ruling. Because if she had taken over, if if we'd had uh, the Viserys to Rhaenyra easy, perfect, smooth handover that she was probably hoping for, then she would have inherited a prosperous realm, which doesn't, didn't, need and she used she would be in a good place herself and probably she would have been a reasonable ruler she had been brought up by Viserys to 
um, to know how to rule. So that's half the battle. Um, Viserys, I suspect most people would say, was not the greatest leader, the greatest king. However, the maesters are very clear that most people within Westeros view Viserys's reign as being the apex, the height of Targaryen power, because it was a peaceful and happy and bounteous time. So could she have been a good ruler in other times? Yeah, I think absolutely she could. Um, we just never got the chance to see it. So um, Viserys would have been a terrible leader in wartime, I'm absolutely sure, but we didn't get to see that either. Okay, let's go to... Um, got a few questions in the chat. Um, Chelsea Oliver saying, Hi, Robert. Hi there. Uh, how do you envision things would be different had Rhaenyra been male? Could it have avoided the Dance of the Dragons, um, married Alicent or Lena? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if, if she'd been male, then there would have not... I'm, I mean, to say there would not have been a war. I think a war was going to happen regardless because that's what Targaryens are like. Um, but the main the main aim um, of, or the main argument for her not inheriting was based on the fact that she was a woman. So um, I think that the initial stance would have been the same um Alison would have married i mean if we kind of try and map out the history um she would have been named heir and then Alison would have married in um uh to uh i think probably still to viserys and she would have had her children but no one would have said that aegon should be the first in line um that does not mean that there would not have been a coup attempt um but I think it does mean that fewer people would have rallied behind him, um, behind Aegon, because the justification was not really there. Um, Christomir Rakov saying, so did I calculate correctly that Rhaenyra is the great, 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 great grandmother of Daenerys. That's six times great. Um, well, I will take your word for that because um, uh, off the top of my head, it sounds about right. Um, somebody in the chat will be able to pick up on this. Um, go and have a look at the um, uh, the family tree. But if you, one of the things which is n notable is that all of the Targaryens that follow um, come from Daemon. All of the kings um, and uh, the, the two kings which follow after the Dance of the Dragons, they, they were the two children of Daemon and um, Rhaenyra. And so it is actually Daemon's line because his two children with Lena also survive. And it is through those lines that we get down through all of the rest of the Targaryens. Uh, Martin S. saying, can George R. R. Martin's world, uh, in George R. R. Martin's world, can dragons run out of fire, if only temporarily? Maybe if their lung temperature drops too low by exhaling heat. Granted, one probably shouldn't think too much in terms of real physics with dragons. Um, yeah, so George R. R. Martin is very clear um, that... You shouldn't look for scientific answers to magical things. Um, so I think you've answered your own question to a certain degree there is that no, we that there's no clear scientific answer to this. I, th I think it seems reasonably clear from what we've read that dragons can't just do a constant stream of fire without stopping, that it's in short bursts. And the smaller the dragon, the less they are able to do that. So it's... The, the older they grow, uh, the fierce, the stronger the flame, and also the the more flame that they can um, uh, project. Uh, so um, let's not go down into the science of this, but um, there there does seem to be a sort of a limit. 
Uh, AK Channel TV saying, Rhaenyra tried to gaslight the realm. With her being a woman, she needed to be as close to perfect possible, and to say she fell short is an understatement. Um, uh, well, I don't know about gaslighting, but um, in terms of uh, trying to overcome prejudice within the realm, then, uh, yeah, I don't think this helped the, uh, the case for future Targaryen leaders uh female leaders um that she is not remembered well uh in history um in fact although she, i'm including her in this list of targaryen rulers and almost rulers even though she was known as the half year queen she was expunged from the history books as a queen she does not appear on the official list of rulers which has always felt a little bit unfair to me because she was ruling. She sat in King's Landing. She was there on the Iron Throne for six months. She was indisputably actually ruling for that time. But Aegon II announced that she is not going to be counted um, because she was a usurper. And even though he clearly didn't survive all that long and then Rhaenyra's children took over, they seem to not have, like, turn that back um they seem to have just gone oh what fair enough so we'll, we won't have her there um on the list of rulers um so uh yeah she probably would have had to and we see this with danny that she does uh, particularly in the male gaze have to prove herself a whole lot more for her there's also an age thing um in that she is she was 13 at the start of, uh, of book one so she's still very young whereas Rhaenyra is is a bit older um Pierre Davis saying favorite dragon pre-dance um I love Sunfire um favorite dragon I, th I think that yes yeah, Sunfire was beautiful that's what we we hear um I'm not sure if I have a favorite. I, I do. I love the um, Nettles sheep stealer dynamic. I think that works really well for me. Um, I do. I like the idea, which is a. I, think I can't I honestly can't remember where I, I heard this from first. It was might have been Germination. I can't remember this idea that Dreamfire may. Um, match up well with helena because it is this is where dragon dreams come from dragon dreams are a um uh associated with uh riders of dreamfire and that works really well for me so um yeah maybe maybe them but i yeah i'm not sure that the thing is that the 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 books i mean it's I'm not wishing to criticize george R. martin but in in the the books do not develop the characters of the different dragons as much as the show has put an effort into. So we might get like a line about a character of a dragon, um, uh, but we, and also a few words about their coloring or something like that. The show has attempted to give us a greater flavor of the differences between the different dragons. Um, Let's go to a question from Alhad saying, Hi, Robert. On the show, the Blackwood Bracken feud was referred to and happened twice in the presence of Rhaenyra. Where do you think they're going with this? Okay, so um, the Bracken Blackwood um, rivalry in the books is a massive thing, always in the background, but this is a really big thing. Two ancient houses in the Riverlands, uh, they're. Um, constantly bickering constantly at war with one another they um and we see this coming through history the world of ice and fire gives us bits of history through this we see this here in the dance of the dragons we see it um appearing in reminiscences from people uh, we saw it in the uh aegon's invasion this just keeps on coming and keep on coming. They didn't pick up on this at all in Game of Thrones, the TV show. So what are they doing with it here? Because it has been shown, name-checked a couple of times on House of the Dragon. Well, I think the first thing 
is uh, uh, quite simply, I think that the showrunners were just trying to show us, the fans, that they knew about this kind of stuff. They knew about the wider world beyond just these main houses, and they wanted to show us a little bit of it. And they could do that very easily um, in the ways that they did. They can just show us a little bit of it, and we, the fans, go, ah, it's the Brackens and the Blackwoods. I get, I see what you're doing there. The vast majority of people would just think, oh, it's two random houses. So I think that's the first thing. Um, it was just a little bit of signaling for us, the fans, to, to show us that they knew what they were doing. But it does, I think, have a story purpose. Um, the, there are two parts to how this will probably play out. The first is the um, battles in the Riverlands. What we should have, probably even in the first episode or two of uh, season two, is we should have Damon taking uh, or flowing on Craxies over to the mainland, going to the Riverlands, and basically trying to call the banners because the strategic situation for team black at the end of season one was that they had no allies on the mainland that's why they were sending people out everywhere to try and find some allies and damon basically said right i'm going to go to harren hall um, i'm going to claim that and then try and get as many people in the riverlands to come and support us so that we've got some kind of a foothold on the mainland now what happens then is that there's a series of two or three battles. They're not huge battles, but they they turn into battles between Brackens and uh, Blackwoods. And so I think if they're wishing to show a little bit about how the Riverlands, they're divided, an easy way to do that is by showing this Bracken-Blackwood um, uh, rivalry. The second thing is that we have a very important Blackwood character who should appear in season four, and they probably want to just tee, tee this up a little bit so that we're not, not just going, wow, who is, where's this person come from? Well, why is this house at all important? Um, and that is Ali, Black Ali um, Blackwood. Now, she... Um, plays a hugely important role right at the very end. When we get the Hour of the Wolf, everybody in the fandom, they love Craig and Stark. He comes down uh, right at the end of the war and basically is the boss for um, just a small period of time. But he just says, right, okay, who needs executing? Right, I'm executing them. Who else needs attacking? Right, I'm going to go and attack them. Let's just deal with all of this stuff and get it done. Um, and it's a very kind of stark kind of approach. But if you take a step back from that, what you see happening there is that everybody has now just been run into the ground. The the main houses now, almost all of them have lost their head of house, and then now they've got um, a child often ruling their house. Um, and the Starks want to come and start attacking people left, right, and centre. Right, let's march on Castle Rock. Let's go down to Old Town. They're just, the, the Craig and Stark is all for just carrying on this war. But there's a small group of people in King's Landing who go, you know what? Let's. Uh, let's just stop this. Let's see whether we can get people, send a few ravens out, see whether we can get a few replies. Black Alley plays a part in that. She basically says, I will marry you, Craig and Stark, um, if you agree to um, uh, give amnesty to these people, basically, if you agree to come along with this plan. And he does. And it is her uh, whispering the right words in his ear that seems to have actually won the day there. Otherwise, the war would have carried on. So she is a hugely important character. And if she just sort of suddenly appeared, bing, like that, in like the penultimate episode, it's like, well, where does this person come from? But actually, they need to be introducing her, showing how that she, she's an incredibly strong um Archer, she's uh, great in battle. She's a really good, strong character, and they will want to be introducing her, I imagine, 
a little bit earlier in the story, maybe even something like season three, they will start to bring her into this so that when Craig and Stark comes down, it's not suddenly, okay, we've got two characters that we didn't really know before um, and now they're going to get married and that's the end. It's that we do know these characters. Uh, we know where Craig and Stark's come from and we also know where she has come from. Um, uh, is there Ahmed saying what what were the Martells doing when all of this was happening? Um, sitting sitting back and drinking some cool orange juice, I think, is the, uh, the short answer there. They were not part of the Seven Kingdoms at this point. Um, and there is absolutely no reason why they would want to get involved in a war. So uh, they were happily sitting back. They did start to get potentially get involved, um, but uh, the... In, in the main, they just decided, no, we're not, uh, we're not doing that. Um, <laughs> a reflective rambling saying, season three from your mouth to the writer's ears. The more Craig and Ali, the more smiles for me. Well, I think we will see Craig and Stark in season two. Um, and uh, then that's going to go quiet. This is what should happen, I think, is that we should have two, three episodes of the Starks um, in season two. Then they basically agree to get involved, and then we shouldn't see them again until, or shouldn't see the Starks, Craig and Stark again until the second half of season four. Um, Ali, uh, I think we'll probably, as I say, probably see introduced some point in season three. Um, Alhad saying, uh, many try to see parallels between Daenerys and Rhaenyra, except for being Targaryen women who have to wage battles for the throne, I don't see any major ones. For me, Danny seems to be much more nuanced, level-headed, till now at least, and determined than Rhaenyra. What do you think? Also, we never get Rhaenyra's POV to make such a comparison. Yeah, so um, this is something that a lot of people have um, tried to draw comparisons. Um, I think there is the name Rhaenyra, Daenerys. Uh, it kind of they they do sort of echo one another. There's the fact, but definitely they both feel as if the throne should rightfully be theirs and has been taken away from them. Um, so they both will have to come in. I I suspect Danny certainly on the show she took uh, took over um, Dragonstone and then sort of invaded from there i have a feeling that's probably roughly what's going to happen in the book not in the same way but roughly so there are echoes of this um so i can see why people see this danny is much younger um and she is wanting to invade rather than just reclaim what should have been hers so there is a huge difference. The thing that probably most people, and you, you sort of talked about this, is this kind of dark path most people are sort of focused on. Rhaenyra was the realm's delight. At the end of it, she's Mago with teats. She's, she's being held up as being a terrible uh, uh, person who's done terrible things to the, the small folk of King's Landing. That echoes for some people with where the show went with uh, Daenerys is that she started out as being this wonderful person, freeing slaves, etc, etc. Then by the end of it, she's doing terrible things to the people of King's Langley. It, it, will that happen in the books? Not like that. But she is going to go down a dark path, not where well, I think this is what George R. Martin has said. Uh, she is going to go down a darker path in uh, certainly in the winds of winter. Um, does that create an echo? Yes, but as I said earlier, I think the bigger echo is between Rhaenyra and Cersei, not Rhaenyra and Daenerys. Um, the, the one thing I would hold up, though, as a thing to keep an eye on, not something saying this is what's going to happen, Rhaenyra, the way it's presented to us is Rhaenyra's dark path, if we think of it like that, seems to have started with the deaths of her children. And that was what sort of pushed her down this towards the anger and the hatred. Danny, if she loses a dragon, which is, those are her children, then she will go down a darker path, 
I'm absolutely sure of that. Um, but will it be the same dark path? I don't think so. Martin S saying, do you think um, House of the Dragon could use any Doctor Who actor other than Matt Smith in any role? Um, any who would fit in well somewhere. It may or may not be the Doctor himself. Um, well, I'd love Christopher Eccleston to get a job somewhere doing something. Um, I think he's a fantastic actor um, and uh, cruelly overlooked for many, many uh, jobs for quite a few years. Um, uh I'm just trying to think of it. I could think of something that Peter Capaldi could be doing in uh, in House of the Dragon. Um, I think this is one I'd love to throw open to the chat. I'll come and have a look in the chat. Can you think of any Doctor Who, other than Matt Smith, um, any Doctor Who actors who might work really well um, in House of the Dragon? I'm just trying to match up people to... Um, I don't think any of them work really well as being Craig and Stark. Mm, okay. Let's leave it to the chat, and I will come back to that. That's a really interesting question, Martin. Uh, like, thank you. AK Channel TV uh, asking, will they keep the Magor nickname in the show? I think they probably will. They won't um, They won't linger on it, would be my guess, um, because then they'd have to explain who Magor is. Um, but, yeah, I think they will... They're, they're, why not? They, they're actually the thing we always have to remember is that they've got not much source material here. We we're here happily saying this is four seasons worth of material. Um, let's not forget that the first book of A Song of Ice and Fire was turned into one season of a TV show. We are for this for the Dance of the Dragons, adapting a couple of hundred pages, something like a quarter of that volume for not one season, but four seasons. So we are having to expand out from the source material here. So when they get source material, more often than not, they when they have it, then I think they'll want to use it. Uh, Train Surfer saying, perhaps Peter Capaldi would be good as the shepherd. Oh, I like that. Um, that would be an excellent... Yeah, he, I think he would be fantastic as that. Uh, Kaius Ballerina saying, Shuti Gatwa is one of the Velaryon dragon seeds. Yeah, that's a really um, good one. Uzair Ahmed saying, Jenna Coleman could play as someone. Yes, she could. I'm trying to work out whether Jenna Coleman would work well as a um, Black Alley. Perhaps not. Um, uh Having a quick flick through. Callie Summer saying David Tennant has to, has yet to do a bad job at anything. Not sure where he'd fit in. He'd be a great Jaharis the first or Anis. Yeah, I th actually, yeah, Anis Targaryen. I think he would work quite well. Um, um, is there Ahmed saying Jenna Coleman could play Viserys the second or Aegon the third's wife? Yeah, that's quite an interesting one. Um, yeah, I think. Did, Jenna Coleman, I think there's yeah a lot of love going for that. Um, uh, yeah, okay, there's some good questions in in uh, in there. Mandip Gill for nettles would be lovely. Yeah, that would be a, a really interesting uh, casting. Uh, I'd like that. I'll come back to this. I'll have another look at some of them. I'll, I'll answer another question and then come back and say keep those uh, suggestions going. Um, Colt Foster. Uh, saying, uh, my question today is is about my own sanity, as it seems like I'm the only person who has the opinion that Jaceris, Lucerus, and Joffrey are the legitimate heirs of Lenor Velaryon. To me, the thought of this continent-wide civil war that leads to the eventual downfall of Targaryen supremacy would be made all the more poetic and tragic if it really was just the ego of a handful of people trying to put specific people into power. It reminds me of how many lives were lost in the Great War enlarged to the egos of uh, George V, uh, Nicholas II, and the Kaiser Wilhelm II. Am I crazy here? So are you crazy thinking that the uh, Gisarus, Lucerus, and Joffrey are the legitimate heirs of Lenor? I mean, perhaps. Uh, I think the overwhelming evidence is no. Uh, they are not. Uh, I think the overwhelming evidence is that they are Harwin Strong's children. Now, this is not just sort of like 
rumors and stuff like that there first of all there's the physical appearance thing they actively looked like um harwin strong not just that they were missing the targaryen features but they had the strongs have like a we're told us sort of like a pug nose they've got the brown hair uh broad uh shoulders they had all of those kind of strong features to them so there's that uh secondly there's the fact that um Lenor clearly is gay. And thirdly, the fact that we're told that they hardly spent any time together. Um, so uh, the the chance, the opportunities for them to be making babies were minimal. So I think, um, given the fact that nobody really seems to doubt that Harwin Strong was Rhaenyra's lover, it's it, it seems a pretty open and shut case. Now, does that make it 100%? No, absolutely. So you're not crazy to think that there's a possibility. Um, it's just that all of the evidence we have s suggests that that's what was going on. Um, let's uh, have a quick flick through. So um, John Potts saying David Tennant can do dark characters. Uh, and Jessica Jones, you pointed out, yeah, the, the purple man there was... Uh, as good a performance as I've seen from David Tennant, it has to be said. Um, Jenna Coleman being Ali um, suggests reflective rambling. Um, agree, weirwood saying Freema uh, Agiman as Reina Targaryen. Um, yeah, that would uh, that would be really interesting. Uh, I'm a big fan of Freema Agiman actually. I think she's uh, she's a great actress. Um, I'm now just trying to think of. Um, Karen Gillan, um, I think there's a character, and I'm struggling to think of who this, there's a character in my mind I know who Karen Gillan I think would be excellent for, um, but I'm having a mind blank, but I think she would be, uh, she would be great in this world. Anyway, let's go to a question. I've got three more questions from my patrons, so now is a good time to, uh, to drop, um, uh, to drop some uh, questions into the chat. Uh, Mary Ann Hadley saying, Rhaenyra and the rest of the Blacks certainly saw that Alicent and the Greens were going to oppose her. I don't understand why those who supported the Blacks didn't make some kind of political move to prop up her claim. Funding public works, establishing greater control over armies, PR stunts like jousts or royal visits on Dragonback. Did she not know she had real competition? Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, I think this is really interesting it's one of those things that because with hindsight they should have done that and and i think you're right they they should and probably could have done that but this probably shows what uh a bit about their character so what we're talking about here is rhaenyra herself and damon really and maybe there was a an arrogance, an entitlement there. Maybe there was something about their characters that thought they don't need to do that. That's not really, I'm the realm's delight. Of course, people uh, love me. Um, people have already uh, sworn to um, uh, to uphold me being the, uh, the new queen. Of course they will. Um, Damon, incidentally, in a slightly different situation but if you go back in time um to the great council of 101 when viserys was named king daemon was out there before the result was known gathering together an army because he thought that Corlys Velaryon was going to try and um uh take the throne so he has form of that kind of thing but didn't seem to be doing that so there is a um there's a question about why? Now, I think that the first half of this is she was quite young um, and uh, maybe she didn't really understand that she had to do anything. But in the last few years, then that does leave quite a big question mark, because why wouldn't you do something more? And what the what more is actually not the point. You've suggested a little bit of PR, maybe going out, visiting people on Dragonback. Maybe they could have um, spent some time uh, building the relationships with the people that they thought need they needed on their side. Um, maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe they could have thrown a bit of money to bribe some people. 
there's lots of possibilities. They didn't seem to do any of them. Now, the show seems to imply, and this is an answer to this question, the show seems to imply the reason is that basically for that last period of time, she was just living a happy life in Dragonstone with her family, with her husband, her children, and they were cut off from what was going on in King's Landing. So the death caught them, or the um, impending death caught them by surprise. Uh, so that's, um, I think that's a that's a reasonable answer, is that actually they were they were away from King's Landing, so they didn't see it coming. And secondly, she was just happy. And that does add another element to all of this, is that she was, would she have just been happy just there with her family on Dragonstone, which was basically the offer that was put to her, is that if you accept Aegon as king, then you can just stay here on Dragonstone and we'll leave you alone and you can raise your family and all be okay. And she said no, but that does certainly, the implication seems to be that this was a happy time for her. Reflective <clears throat> um, uh, Rambling saying Karen Gillan is too tall for Rohan Weber. Yeah, I mean, simply on hair colour, I think that um, uh, that would uh, uh, work well, but yes, far too tall. Um, uh, Kelly, some are saying Karen Gillan as Alyssa Farman. Yeah, I think that would be really good. Um, uh, Ranabir Mitra saying, off topic, but what do you think of history of Westeros's idea that Mushroom wasn't in fact a character, but rather someone under a guise with extreme connectivity, like Masseria or Laris? I think that's a really good idea. I mean, um, so I, I've not seen... I'll ask because he's about this next time uh, I, I talk to him, but um, I've not seen the, the the full theory. But mushroom as a as a person exists, that much is reasonably clear. There was a court fool called Mushroom who existed and lived through this period of time. Now, the what we have after that is we have this. Um, uh, what was it called? The True Confessions or something of Mushroom. Basically, he then wrote his story. Um, could this have not have been him, but have been someone else? Quite possibly. There's no reason to think that it has to have been him. It could have been anyone. You have to ask, though, what uh, what would people try to achieve? Because it's not like nowadays you might write a book in order to... Um, earn money for yourself that doesn't seem to have been it was just sort of like copied and then handed around it wasn't sold at uh barnes and noble or waterstones or anywhere like that on the high street it was just um uh, somebody wrote a book and then it got passed around so who would have benefited from that somebody who wants to make the targaryens look um foolish lustful not right to rule um if anyone, and just tinfoil theory, if you say someone else would vote it, maybe it was a maester. Um, uh, let's uh, go to... Uh, I had a few more questions in the chat. Um, Caius Bellerina saying, why did Masseria tell Rhaenyra about a relationship between Damon and Nettles? Did she know she'd freak out? Why would she freak out? Did neither know that Damon Philanders? Um, well, I don't know how they're going to go. This is one of the things that fascinates me for the show. I don't know where they're going to go with this. Because in the book, it seems quite clear, is that um, Damon had Messeria as a lover. Um, and then he sort of kept her on as his lover slash um, spy person in King's Landing. And then she became uh, Daenerys's uh, Mistress of Whispers. Um, but then Daemon uh, fell in with, fell in love with perhaps Nettles and Maserius then told Rhaenyra. The implication is that from the book, was that Masseria was a spurned woman. She understood that Damon had to marry these highborn women um, 
uh, like Rhaenyra for the you know, political reasons. She understood that. But him falling in love with somebody completely different, that hurt Miss Area. That's the way I think the book was trying to present it. Are they going to go the same way on the show? Probably not, because the they have expanded out Missaria as a character a huge amount and they've clearly shown that she's moved on from Damon she may still have some feelings of care towards him she certainly didn't want seem to want to hurt him um when he was in her control um in King's Landing but at the same time she doesn't seem to be in love with him anymore so what on in the show what motivation could she have for telling Rhaenyra that well perhaps if, if you try and take it down to the next level perhaps Rhaenyra having come in is not the answer that um Miseria wants she wants somebody who's going to be caring about the small folk and then she suddenly realizes Rhaenyra is not doing that so I want to get rid of Rhaenyra. So perhaps she then tries to take Rhaenyra's reign down from the inside. And perhaps she's the person who sows all these seeds of distrust with all of Rhaenyra's allies. Because Rhaenyra, in that six months, it's not just that while she was in King's Landing, she had a bad tax policy. The people turned against her. She cut off a few heads from people. Yes, she did all those things. But just as crucially... Um, she alienated Corlys Velaryon and House Velaryon, um, and she alienated herself from um, Daemon, which in in that was her two most powerful and important allies, regardless of any family relationship she has with either of them. As allies, those were the most important people she had. So, if if she did cut them off because of what Miseria said it's because Miseria was trying to get rid of her. Uh, Marty Dodger, uh, thank you for the super chat. I can't see a question attached to uh, that one. Um, so I will. Oh, here we go. Say, so, hi, Robert. I was just catching up on um, Viserys the First, and you mentioned something that made me run over here to ask why didn't Aegon the Third of Viserys the Second restore Rhaenyra to the list of rulers. Their claim comes through her. Yeah, so I, I sort of touched on this a moment ago. Actually, it's it's interesting that they don't, um, and we're not told um, in uh, well, we're not told in Fire and Blood because the story cuts off the moment that Aegon the Third comes to power, comes of age, um, and the regency ends. He that's when the story ends. So um, we do not. Uh, we do not know. We're certainly not told in the world of ice and fire. Um, it, would they? They were king anyway, so it didn't affect their claim. So uh, nobody was basically the, the entire realm was just so rocked from this. And who were the only Targaryens who were left? Basically, it's those two brothers, and then their two half sisters. So that they're, they're the they're the Targaryens. They, they're the people to choose from. So actually, whether or not Rhaenyra was in the um, the official line of rulers made no difference to their claim at all. I would have thought that they would have wanted to put their mother's name back up there. But I don't know. Maybe we'll find out in front about part two. Um, AK Channel TV saying, I try not to be biased against the show, but the point of the dance is to show that both sides are problematic, but they portray Rhaenyra as righteous. Um, so at, at this stage, we should be, from the books, we should be thinking, well, Team Green are uh, clearly in the wrong here, um, and we're sort of on the side of Team Black. But very soon we should get to that muddy position that you're talking about there, is that everybody's in the wrong here. Now, um, how exactly they get around blood and cheese, we'll have to wait and see. I do have my theories about that one. But even so, what Rhaenyra does when she's ruling King's Landing and a few other things that happen makes you see Team Black not in such a rosy light. I do not think that 
all the way through this, it's going to be um, uh, such uh, uh, everyone looking good all the time. I think that these characters are going to become more grey. But what they did, I, I felt on the show, was at this point in the book where they're thinking that what Team Green did is pretty unjustifiable. They basically just wanted power. Um, but they sh on the show, they've tried to give a little bit more context for it. The thing with Alicent hearing Viserys' dying words and misinterpreting them, that wasn't in the book. That's not... Uh, that that's not what was going on there um but it's it's very clear that on the show we may disagree with her but we can understand why she thought that and we see a lot more of her character to to make her appear a lot um more easily related relatable to so and even Amond, who in the book comes across as really quite um a, a horrific character on the show, there have been a couple of moments of um, uncertainty, sadness. Um, when he lost control of Vagar, when Vagar killed Arax, the camera looks at Eamon's face, and for just a moment, there's this horror there. There's that, that I wasn't trying to do that. That wasn't what I was trying to do. They have tried to soften Team Green as well as Team Black. Um, Caius Bellarina saying, How did keeping um DNL in Essos so long change Rhaenyra's relationship with her stepdaughters? And um, so uh, this is Damon and Lena. Um, how did it change Rhaenyra's relationship with her stepdaughters and sort of in laws? Um, so she had a good relationship with Lena. Um, I think. I do buy into this idea that that Damon, as they they did on the show in in the book, that Damon and Rhaenyra's relationship, as as weird and toxic in many ways as it is, it was established at a very young age and carried on regardless of periods of time when they were not together. So I think that did not affect much. So I don't think this will have affected hugely. Um, that side of things but you're asking about the relationship effectively with the in-laws um the fact is so the Valarians were in-laws for both of them um so that i don't think affected much um then damon's children <clears throat> we don't really hear about it but she was clearly happy enough for them to be um uh betrothed to her own sons so i i I, th I think I coming around to that it didn't affect it huge amounts. Um, Chaos Ballerina saying, "Why not have an affair with a Valarion looking man?" Uh, so this is a, uh, I think referring to Harwin Strong. Why didn't if Rhaenyra was wanting to have um, uh, an affair with somebody, why not pick somebody who looks more like Lenor? I mean, I think it's that the, the the heart wants what it wants and i think this this feels quite true to life is that yes you get and this is a thing which happens in many stories is that people are choosing their lover based upon the looks that they wish to try and hide who the true parent of their children is i the the impression is that rainera just fell in love with harwin, harwin strong and she had children with him and she thought you know what i'm the queen i can do what i want i'm a targaryen uh, so I think I think that's it. Um, uh, let's go to a I'm having a quick flick through see whether I've got any more um, uh, things in the chat. I'll come back to the chat in just one moment. Mara Lee asking what I would consider Rhaenyra's legacy. Would Rhaenyra be her own worst enemy with how she treated her people? Um, hence having folks comparing her reign with King Maegor. So her legacy is a, a really interesting one because it's not, she's not well remembered. Um, her, as I've already said, her, her main legacy is that her children ruled after her. So that's a big legacy. It's, it, you could argue, I mean, 
I argue quite a lot that Damon won the Dance of the Dragons because his four children were the ones who survived. But Rhaenyra's children reigned after her, which is what she wanted. She ruled for a bit, and then there was a small gap, and then her son ruled. So um, one could argue that she actually, her legacy there is good. But in terms of how she was remembered. I'm just going to have a quick flick through. This is on the the, the wiki, which is always a, a good place to uh, to go. But there are a couple of quotes from A Song of Ice and Fire about Rhaenyra, um, which I, I think show how her legacy... She is remembered by, <coughs> pardon me, by the ruling class of Westeros. Um, and she is used as a justification for certain things. So this is Ariane Martel to Aris Oakhart when she's trying to persuade him basically um, that he he can decide who should be ruler. She says, the first Viserys, that's the Viserys we know, uh, intended his daughter Rhaenyra to follow him. Do you deny it? But as the king lay dying, the Lord Commander of the King's Guard decided that it should be otherwise. So um, her... Rhaenyra herself should have been queen, but then somebody else was there stopping it. So Alice, um, so um, uh, Ariane is using Rhaenyra as a moral example to try and push somebody towards what she wants them to do. Stannis, when talking to Davos, also says this. Traitors have always paid with their lives even Rhaenyra Targaryen. She was the daughter to one king and mother to two more, yet she died a traitor's death for trying to usurp her brother's crown. So he is using this as an example of her being a usurper, which is a completely different way to how we kind of interpret um, her reign. But for him, he's thinking about his own brother trying to usurp his claim. So um, he's trying to show traitors die. So what is Rhaenyra's legacy? People remember the story and then use it for whatever purpose they want. That's her legacy. She's not remembered well um, by uh, the, the people of Westeros, but they're happy to use her story um, as, a, as a justification for whatever point they're trying to be making, which is a very George R. R. Martin way of doing these things. JG, uh, JD Finity um, uh, in the chat saying, not Rhaenyra related, but I've missed your last few streams, so I hope it's okay. Um, why do you think more of Jaehaerys's children that survived ch uh, childhood didn't claim dragons, along with Emma Arryn? Um, well, there weren't that many, <coughs> is the short answer. The, the amount of dragons expanded hugely um, towards the end of Jaehaerys' reign and then into uh, Viserys' reign. That's when the dragons started appearing. Um, so there weren't huge amounts to start with. Um, now, uh, why didn't some of them just didn't want to? Some of them were waiting. Um, so Arya seems to have been waiting to, to claim the dragon that she wanted to claim. Um, and some of them, like... Sarah didn't seem like she, she was that interested. Also, I always forget his name, but the, the, the one who went off to become a maester, he seems not to have been interested in that kind of thing. Quite a lot of Jaehaerys' children died very young. So it's, um, I think it's a mixed answer, is the, the short uh, one. Um, we certainly had three, he says, um, Two of his children and three grandchildren all claimed dragons. So it's not like there were none. Um, uh, there definitely were some, but yeah, it's it's um, uh, some decided to pursue other things. Some did not survive old enough to, until they were old enough. Some um, were waiting, and some did claim dragons. So I think that's the the sort of the the short answer. Um, and I've got one more question from uh, my patrons, then I will um, 
flick through the chat. Lady Pushkin's saying, hi, Robert, is it possible to have an open Winds of Winter live stream, please? I think it will be this year. Um, uh, I always hesitate to um, say when I think the Winds of Winter will be, so I will I, I will not predict now. Um, uh, an open Winds of Winter live stream? Yeah, we'll do one of them at some point um, this year. I'm very happy to do that. Also, we will do one. I did one when I finished uh, Game of Thrones, I will do another open Q&A about A Clash of Kings, which I'm very close to um, finishing my re-listen through. Um, so we'll do that in a few weeks' time, I think, as well. Um, but uh, let's have a quick look in the chat. Um, do you think Aegon III was a good king? This is as Ahmed saying, and was he a better king than his grandfather Viserys I? Well, we haven't got all the details on Aegon III, um, <coughs> but the impression seems to be that the the main figure around there was Viserys, the main figure around that time, um, uh, the brains of the, the the operation. We haven't had that bit yet of fire and blood obviously because they cut that off um during his time the dragon dragons died out and this is what he is remembered for is that his fault almost certainly not um or at least uh mostly not uh, because to start with at the beginning of his reign he hated dragons understandable um uh, because you know he'd seen his mother being eaten by one but um he he got rid of all of the dragon's eggs from King's Landing. He just said, no, they're gone. Which, if you go with the dragon eggs were poisoned theory, actually suddenly makes a whole lot of sense because suddenly they were no longer in the sight of the Targaryens and anyone who was taking them somewhere was in charge of the dragon eggs. Who would take them? Perhaps the maesters. So, was he a good king? We don't have the evidence to say it. Um, either way, he certainly, uh, during his time, what could have been potentially the end of the Targaryen reign, um, they pulled through. It's it's worth, just at a macro level, just, I think, thinking about the fact that this is a huge shift. The, the height of Targaryen power was with Viserys. Then we had the Dance of the Dragons, which got rid of huge amounts of both Targaryens and dragons. During the reign of Aegon III, the remaining dragons all went. So from him onwards, through Viserys II, this was a new role for the Targaryens. They no longer had what they had had all that time, the first 150 years or whatever of their rule. They had the dragons. And so if anybody opposed them, they would just fly there with a dragon and burn them. It was brutal, but effective. For the, from um, Aegon III, Viserys II onwards, they didn't have that. And so they had to change what it meant to be Targaryen rulers. So it's not just about the, we could burn you with our dragons if you do not comply. Actually, you had to rule with some degree of consent. So who was in charge of that shift? My instinct is that that's more Viserys than uh, than Aegon, but it was quite an important moment in Targaryen history. Um, let's... Um, uh, Bobo String saying it's, uh, it's way past bedtime over here. Well, thank you for staying up late. Um, uh, True Yellow Dart saying Viserys II was technically only king for a year, but really was ruler for many, many more. Yes, this is, I'm really looking forward to um, uh, reading more about him whenever we do get far and about part two. Reflective Rambling saying, did Robert notice my random suggestion for the next landmark reward while I was gone? No, I did not. Um, I will see what I see it. Um, Andrew Case seeing, saying, personally, I see... Um, Rhaenyra seeing herself as the exception rather than the champion of female claimants overall. Even in war mode, decisions overlooking elder female heirs undermine her own claim. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think I would agree. I didn't, she, she never gave the impression of saying um, this changes the, or, you know, the, the rights of succession. It was just a, but this is me. 
uh, I am the heir. I've been named heir. So I, she doesn't seem to have had the kind of brain that goes to the let's set up the the exact rules of succession and then they follow from now on. Um, so yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. Um, um, let's quick flick through, back through. Uh, I can't see this uh, suggestion from Reflective Rambling, so uh, apologies for, for that. That will have to wait until uh, next time. Um, next week, I will be doing uh, one more on uh, this. Uh, we will be looking at Aegon the Second um, before I think we'll then move on to, we'll probably have a Lord of the Rings live stream in a couple of weeks' time. But next week, we will look at Aegon the Second, who does not come out well so far in House of the Dragon season one. It has to be said, there are a few different changes to the books, but he doesn't come out well, well in the books either. So it'll be, um, uh, it'll be quite interesting to see how they develop that character on in the show. Whether they do try and get make us more sympathetic towards him, I don't think they've tried to make us sympathetic towards him yet, um, but they have tried to show us a few other angles to his personality let's put it that way so uh that's what's happening next week um i've forgotten to say moderators thank you so much you do an amazing work um thank you if you are there in the chat could you please show a little bit of love for the moderators uh they keep the chat uh, uh a safe place for everybody to uh, uh to be uh, just expressing their opinions freely um patrons thank you very much um if you wish to support this channel the best way to do that is through patreon there's a link down in the description the other thing i will just plug quickly is my other channel the new channel i'm setting up idg live um, i mentioned it a little bit earlier as of may these live streams are going to be moving over to there i'm excited by that new channel a lot of live content a lot of short form content more interviews live streams that's all going to be happening over that channel um, there's a link down in the description and in a moment right in the middle of the screen is going to be appearing a link um, to that. Uh, if you want more videos appearing somewhere here is going to be a link to that. Okay, that's all for this time. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it a fantastic little chat. Um, I will see you again next time. Take care.